Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Ozcast. Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategic On, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. On Sunday the 14th of February, we in Australia learned of Donald Trump's acquittal from his historic second impeachment trial, triggered as a consequence over his alleged role in sparking the 6th of January insurrection that saw Trump loyalists storm the Capitol building in Washington DC. Joining me from our studio in Adelaide's grand old Epworth building is co-host David Olney. Hello, David. Greetings. And our producer and part-time spiritualist and asker of questions, Tim Whiffen. <laughs> part-time spiritualist, yes. Thank you for having me. <laughs> i got to find out where that came from. That's a whole other episode. Well, that's when he wasn't here and I had to ask Ah, oh, when he was Ghosty here. Tim. He right. was Ghosty Tim. So, you know, it's it's part of our gag now. You know, right. we just need a Ouija board and everything will be fine. <laughs> To discuss the whole Trump second impeachment thing and what it means for the United States politically, joining us today is senior SIA non-resident research fellow and member of the SIA advisory board, Dr. Imad K. Haab, who incidentally lives relatively close to the action in Washington, D.C. in neighboring Virginia. Greetings, Imad. Good evening to you. Good evening to everyone. So I'll kick things off, gentlemen. Imad, I must ask the obvious foreigner question. If Trump was always going to be acquitted, what was the point of having a second impeachment? Was it a Democrat show trial, something to give Trump a little heartburn and placating anti-Trumpers and never-Trumpers without ever being serious about charging the former U.S. president? Well, it's a a very good question. It's actually the the crux of this whole thing. Uh, There absolutely is uh, no way somebody can deny that there is politics in this whole thing. Of course, the Democrats do want to play politics. After all, impeachment is a political, not a criminal kind of investigation and legal uh, way of uh, going after uh, former President uh, Donald Trump. Uh, The the issue was the Democrats have highlighted this and many here in the learned uh, political uh, uh, community here. uh, The issue was, has always been that uh, the Democrats want to send a message, uh, and actually a lot of other people like them, want to send a message that uh, you know a former president or a sitting president should not be doing what transpired on January 6th, namely that uh, he incited an insurrection and incited uh, thousands of his people to come to the Capitol to stop the, a, a constitutional process of uh, counting the electoral votes for uh, that would uh, result in the, uh, in the uh, certification of a new president to take over uh, government on the uh, 20th of January. Uh, the Democrats uh, uh, used that as a second impeachment, but the problem was that the timing was uh, really inauspicious. Uh, the House of Representatives uh, voted to impeach the president on the 13th of January. And on the 15th of January, they uh, wanted to walk over the article of impeachment of incitement of insurrection uh, to the uh, Senate. But the Senate was not in recess. And the Senate uh, majority leader, Mitch McConnell, who was a Republican, uh, told them that uh, well, we're, we're closed for business. So uh, come back on the 19th of January. But uh, when they showed up on the 19th of January, uh, uh, the, the, there was hardly any time because on the 20th of January, Joe Biden was sworn in. Thus, the uh, uh, the uh, object of that impeachment, Donald Trump, uh, uh, had become a former president. Thus, the uh, Republicans basically said that it's too late now to convict or actually to try a former president. It's really, it really makes no difference. So 
uh, it's, uh, it's, there was a lot of politics in it. And uh, at the same time, what the Democrats were trying to do is make a constitutional principle uh, fit, uh, specifically because they wanted, they knew that the Republican uh, majority, or rather the, the Republicans of the Senate uh, were not reliable to really vote to uh, convict the president, but they wanted to send that message that the former president or a sitting president cannot break the law but at the same time, they were trying to arrive at another goal, which is the goal, had he been convicted, the goal would have been to vote again by a simple majority, which meant 51 votes in the Senate, to deprive the president of his right as a private citizen to run again for public office, public federal office. So. Uh, in, uh, in a way, they wanted to convict the president, and after conviction, to prevent him from running again for public office. Uh, but uh, both of these have uh, actually failed. Now, the only uh, uh, recourse uh, for the Democrats or people who are opposed to what Trump did on the 6th of January is to try him in regular court, try him uh, in, a, in criminal court and uh, try to stick that uh, accusation on him uh, in a criminal court. But um, arguably... Trump and his legal team, as incompetent as they appear, will somehow slide out from under all of this, right? I mean, I hate to be cynical about this, but it it looks like that that will be the case. Can I jump in here just because something about this whole thing where it next goes to court has been baffling me, and maybe Ahmad understands this better than we do here in Australia. Mm. So here in Australia last week, there were some really interesting interviews in the media here with law professors talking about the third clause of the 14th Amendment, which is unlike impeachment, which is only for a president, the third clause of the 14th Amendment is about stopping anyone holding office or holding office again if they are shown to not be appropriate. So it is not a criminal trial in the sense of the criminal code. It is still a constitutional matter. But what it means is that the Democrats will essentially start that process in the D.C. courts in front of three judges. And that will then, if the D.C. court, all three judges say, no, look, Trump should never hold office again, where it's about three judges, not about politicians. That then goes to the Supreme Court, once again in front of three justices, and I think it has to be unanimous. So it seems to me that really the only point of the impeachment was to show that even a minority of Republicans are willing to support him not holding public office again. And that this next step, you know, two of the law professors I heard talking about this made the point that there are so few people in America that even understand this clause because the last time it was used was nearly 100 years ago. (laughs) But it's there, which means it can be used. Yes, that is that is that is uh, true. Uh, with just slight uh, clarification that. uh, Yeah, thanks for that, uh, because we don't have much information here. Yeah, the, the, the 14th Amendment has a stipulation that anyone who has uh, aided and abetted an insurrection against the uh, Union uh, should be uh, uh, barred from or should be basically fired and barred from office as well. Uh, the, the, the other clarification is also impeachment does apply to non-presidents. So oh, also okay. uh, people in the federal government like uh, you know secretaries of uh, defense and state okay. and uh, uh, whatever federal officers uh, they are, it applies also to judges uh, and uh, to people in the judiciary in general. And uh, the impeachment uh, basically goes the same way. So pretty much anyone appointed by Congress can be impeached by Congress because they were the authorizing power. The, well, yeah, it's uh, the, the thing is, the issue is the, the appointed by Congress issue. Appointed by Congress is, the president is not appointed by Congress. Congress just certifies, certifies the state's yeah. um, uh, co- uh, electoral college votes. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's uh, the, the the president uh, is basically uh, is, is elected by the electoral college, and mm-hmm. uh, so the Congress only certifies that. So it's, he's not really appointed. But what what happens? Uh, and for instance, in 1870, there was the Secretary of uh, Defense. Uh, at the time, it was the Secretary of War, uh, who had done uh, uh, some uh, uh, bad things, and uh, uh, but he uh, he still he um, uh, resigned 
but he still uh, was uh, uh, tried and convicted. He was impeached after he left office, was tried, and he was convicted uh, in uh, in the Senate. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily have to apply only to sitting presidents or to presidents in general. It applies to everybody. And the you know the the, the legal the legal uh, uh, issue here is. Uh, uh, as far as I, I heard over the last two or three months, uh, the majority of legal scholars are saying that even the former president would or former uh, official would still be liable for impeachment and uh, conviction, uh, specifically in, in the in the president's uh, situation. And this is something that the House managers in the latest uh, impeachment case. Uh, have highlighted uh, uh, Jimmy Rask and the uh, the director of uh, the boss, uh, so to speak, of uh, the people who tried the president, uh, the uh, top manager of the impeachment hearing, um, basically uh, said that uh, there should not be a January exception. In other words, uh, if a president were to do malfeasance and were to uh, really do uh, unconstitutional things in the last two or three weeks of his presidency, and then you bring him to the House for impeachment and later uh, trial in the uh, Senate. And if he is, uh, and if he finishes his term and he's out of office, then uh, you know all presidents might want to do some really egregious things uh, in the last couple of weeks of the uh, of their uh, term, uh, simply because they will be former presidents when uh, the impeachment comes to the Senate and the uh, the trial begins. So uh, that's this is this is basically the major legal argument for this, that there should not be a January exception to the rules of impeachment. The vote to acquit Trump was not that close at 57 votes to 43. Was this a matter of the system or the swamp looking after itself? I mean, after all, the people in the political elite behind closed doors all take good care not to shaft each other for fear of reaping the whirlwind of public acrimony themselves, right? Well, you know, it's... it's, uh, you know, the swamp is unfortunately the swamp is the swamp, and I have uh, I have the feeling that it will always be a swamp. Uh, you know, Washington D.C. is not to be a very uh, a politically clean city, uh, but uh, uh, the problem is uh, that uh, you know it was actually I don't want to use the word, but I will use it. It's shameful that uh, 43 Republicans out of 50 Republicans in the Senate would still acquit the president. Uh, who was actually truly, truly uh, out there trying to get his uh, people riled up to stop the electoral process from finishing uh, on the 6th of January. So uh, it's really unfortunate that uh, 43 uh, senators did that. Uh, and uh, the, the, well, what's also more unfortunate is that the Republican Party today, after this impeachment vote, um, has uh, actually truly, truly proven itself to be really the, the party of Trump. It's not the Republican Party anymore. Uh, there are a lot of people in the party who are really dismayed at what, uh, what, uh, what happened, uh, who are really dismayed that uh, so many uh, Republican senators really uh, uh, went off and did not uh, uh, convict him. Uh, there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of division within the party. A lot of people are splitting off from the party. On the other hand, there are a lot of party organizations in the different states of the union uh, that are censoring the uh, the uh, senators, the seven senators who voted to convict Donald Trump uh, uh, tonight. Uh, exactly tonight in North Carolina, there is a, uh, a meeting of the Republican Party of the state tried to censure uh, uh, the, um, the senator from Carolina, from North Carolina, who voted to, uh, to uh, convict the president, uh, Richard Burr, uh, and uh, basically censure him because he voted to convict the president. Uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, in, 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 other, in other states, in Wyoming, for instance, the, uh, the Republican Party tried to um, censor, uh, 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 what's her name, uh, Cheney, the representative yeah, from Cheney's Wyoming, and, yeah. the, the daughter of the former vice president. In uh, Pennsylvania, they're trying to do the same thing to Pat Toomey, who also voted to convict the president. So the Republican Party has, in its establishment today, has become, has, uh, first of all, it's 
uh, is practically split. But at the same time, those people who are considering that Trump is truly their hero, they still believe in Trump, are the majority, which is which does not bode very well for political life or political party life, so to speak, uh, in the United States. David? Ahmad, we've had sort of the experience of the Tea Party. That was sort of just after the GFC, so that's sort of 12, 13 years ago. So we saw there something like a split off for the Republican Party that sort of was strong for a while and then fizzled. Is there any sense now of what a split in the Republicans might look like and what a new entity might be called or behave like? Well, you know, the, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Where the answer is not there yet. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it, it needs time to uh, work itself out to see what really is going to happen. But uh, from what uh, Mitch McConnell, the leader of the, uh, of the uh, Republicans uh, in the Senate, uh, said after he voted to acquit the president, he he uh, he uh, he made a speech in which he basically said, "Well, no, he was guilty, and yet I voted to acquit him on it, basically on a technicality that it was that he was a former president. Uh, it doesn't apply to him anymore. Impeachment doesn't apply to him anymore. But uh, uh, the the question of how the how the party splits and how uh, in what form it uh, it uh, it shapes up uh, is is very difficult to uh, to tell. It's still too early." Trump has uh, a hold uh, on the uh, rank and file, on the uh, regular uh, partisans of the party, not on necessarily on the uh, on the uh, uh, people who really are uh, the ideologues of the Republican Party. In other words, the the the, the committed conservatives, uh, the committed to, who are committed to you know the capitalist thought and conservative thought and stuff like that. It's, this is this has become uh, uh, Trump's party, the Trump Trump's party, uh, the Trump's populist party, so to speak, and uh, it's uh, nobody knows how much are going to really be with him, but it's assumed that the majority of that party that was uh, just two or three years ago uh, will will remain with him, uh, which means that uh, and your reference to the uh, to the Tea Party is an excellent reference because. Uh, in 2010, the Tea Party really revolted against uh, the establishment, but specifically revolted against Barack Obama being president. And they used everything in the uh, in their uh, their, uh, uh, in their in their power to try to uh, to basically uh, take a, take you know uh, power again uh, away from him. And uh, they actually hobbled him uh, tremendously in 2010. Uh, the Republican Party really gained tens, scores of, of seats in the House of Representatives, and the House uh, changed hands to Republican hands. So um, and now uh, we don't know that what, what, what there is a historical a historical precedent. In 1912, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, uh, who was uh, not necessarily on very good terms with the Republican Party at the time, the Republican Party establishment split from the party and took some people from him, uh, from the party with him, uh, and which weakened the overall organization, which allowed Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, to be elected as uh, president in 1912. And uh, so uh, uh, today, it is definitely, we're talking about more than 100 years later, today's circumstances are definitely different. And uh, uh, what uh, the problem is the Republican Party has become a very reactionary party, if you will, and a uh, very populist party. There is uh, hardly any ideology anymore in the party. It's it's what Trump says, and uh, Trump uh, really over four years he he didn't necessarily say a whole lot of intellectual things. Uh, he was he was uh, there was a dearth of intellectualism in him. But yet, he is the one who is holding on to the majority of the rank and file of the Republican Party. What you've just said is really interesting, Imad, but one of the things that I noted is that there are some people who suggest that, yes, while the Republican Party throughout its history has had its ructions and there have been splits, the Republican Party as an institution has never fallen under a bus. It always manages to reconstitute itself after whatever damage has been caused by a split. Which leads me to my next question. Of the 74 million people who voted in favor of Donald Trump, 
are all 74 million people of the same ilk in terms of readily mobilizable assets by Trump loyalists to create a groundswell? Or if we're looking at the 74 million in total, are maybe a minority within that 74 million, maybe about 10 million, another arbitrary figure, able to be mobilized hardcore Trump supporters and the other 74 million just didn't like Biden? You know, I mean, you have to look at it now. From yeah, are they voting for Trump or are they voting against a Democrat? Right. What's the sense, the sort of feeling there? Yeah. There is, there is, there, there are no numbers on that. There okay. really are no numbers on that. But, uh, but what is in the polls today uh, about the, what, you know, how many people are do believe that Trump did the right thing? Uh, how many people uh, believe that uh, January six was a good thing or a bad thing? There is, there is, it's, 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 the country is split about two thirds who believe, two thirds of Republicans believe that what happened on January 6th was really uh, bad and they uh, do not approve of, uh, of what happened on January 6th. Now, whether these can be translated of, of uh, two thirds of 74 million is a different story. I, I, I don't know if that, if that would be the case, but, but there will be, there will always be a very, very hardcore uh, constituency that will always believe that uh, 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 Donald Trump is their representative. How much, how many of those, we don't, I, I honestly do not know. I don't know if there are any estimates to that, uh, to that effect. But, they, but, but, but there, is, there is something really important here. The 74 million are those people who voted for Donald Trump because he is the Republican candidate. It's not necessarily that they believe that uh, in, in whatever, Repub- whatever, whatever Donald Trump used to say. I mean, I can't believe that 74 million people would uh, really vote for a person who, uh, for instance, according to the, to the Washington Post the tally, you know, lied 30,000 times in four years. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't think that this is really... Uh, uh, a constituency that all that that all be, that believes in everything that Donald Trump said, but there is an, an, a, a, a certain amount of uh, you know tribalist thinking. Uh, there is a, a certain amount of identity thinking here that I am a Republican. I don't care uh, who who is the Republican uh, uh, candidate. I'm going to to elect the Republican candidate no matter what. Uh, so. Um, how many of those? Well, what, what there are uh, there is anecdotal evidence, for instance, that uh, in 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 states there are many Republicans that are just simply shedding off their Republicanism, are saying I'm no longer a, uh, I do not I no longer belong to this party. Uh, today, specifically today, I heard a report from Arizona, uh, you know, uh, uh, John the, the late John McCain's state. Uh, that 10,000 uh, Republicans have broken away from the party since January 6th. About 1,800 of them became Democrats. About, uh, uh, what, about 400, 600, 500 of them became Libertarians. And the rest are neither here nor there, but they're no longer Republicans because of what happened on January 6th. So in, in, uh, in other states, that, that process, I am sure that process is still ongoing, although... A lot of the states' uh, organizations, Republican organizations, are censoring people who stood against Donald Trump in the latest impeachment.
Hey, Mart, if we look back historically, you know, you made the comment that the Republicans really aren't ideological in the way they used to be. So under Reagan, we had a very ideological Republican Party. Under Bush right. Sr., we sort of had the commitment to the same kind of economic policies, but also to the new world order. The whole thing of you know, stopping short at the Iraqi border rather than taking Baghdad. We right. then moved to 2000 and we get... Bush Jr. moving from being ideological to having the quote-unquote base, relying largely on evangelical Christians. How right. has Trump benefited from Bush Jr.'s base? Have the base sort of moved their support to Trump? Is he Does he pretend to be sufficiently conservative that the base now realise we want to be in politics, we want to shape the country, and we will put our weight behind whichever Republican leader you know, gets the most conservative judges on the Supreme Court? Are we seeing any kind of continuity here, or is it a real break from everything? There is and there isn't. Okay, there is, there is a continuity in the idea of conservatism. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, the Republican Party has always wanted to control the, the judiciary. Uh, they have the Federalist Society uh, that was established in the 1980s has been planning for uh, a total control of the judiciary because this is where the buck stops. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever Congress can uh, enact, uh, whatever legislation there is, uh, the courts will be the final uh, arbiter of, uh, of that. So uh, the, the Republicans have worked uh, hard on uh, making their, uh, their brand, so to speak, their conservative brand stick. But however, the, 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 uh, what happened during Bush's years, that, that uh, whole, uh, uh, whole wholesale uh, uh, you know, belief of the evangelical community in the person up top, I mean, the evangelical community is overwhelmingly Republican. Mm. Uh, uh, those were transferred to, 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 to Donald Trump simply because evangelical community leaders saw in Donald Trump somebody who is going to do what they would like them, what, what they would like him to do, although he had all that sordid record. Yeah. As a as a philanderer, as a person who married three times, as whatever, 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 right? And they a lot of them are still sticking with him despite everything that has transpired over the last four or five years, from his behavior, his basically immorality, and all that stuff. The problem is there wasn't necessarily a break between Bush and Donald Trump. Bush left office in January of 2009. Obama came in for two terms until January of 2017. But then those eight years, the Republican Party was taken over by the non-Bushers. In other words, was taken over by a lot of demagogues, a lot of people on Fox News, a lot of people who uh, who uh, spouted all kinds of ideolog- ideological nonsense, really. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Rush Limbaugh's and the uh, uh, Sean Hannity's and the uh, Tucker Carlson and all these people who are uh, media personalities have really had a lot of influence on uh, on the Republican Party and changed it in a very, very populist uh, fashion. Uh, we also have to remember that in 2008, John McCain, the late John McCain, chose his vice president uh, to be Sarah Palin. Yeah. Sarah Palin was a no nothing. Was 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 a nobody. Mm. And and he brought her in, and she took in. She 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 had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, impact on the populism of the Republican Party. In other words, today's Republican Party that was that was. Uh, uh, that is an heir to the Republican Party of the George Bush's years, is uh, a Republican Party that was influenced a lot by what Sarah Palin said. And Sarah Palin what, didn't really know a whole lot. I, but I have to, anyway. All right. This is so good. A Sarah Palin comment that will stick in my head forever, where Sarah Palin says to the journalist, what's the difference between a pit bull and a soccer mom? And the journalist goes, don't know. And Sarah Palin says, lipstick. 
lipstick. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. yeah, yeah. And that no, sums up I, everything she, we need to she, know. <laughs> I look. I, yeah, I, I'm, she's, the I'm, one, she's, she's the one who coined the phrase. I can see Russia from my house. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember that, and that's why I was that's so her, adamant. That's her foreign policy. That's that, her foreign policy experience. And that's why I was so adamant about her success in the Republican race. <laughs> But, you know, uh, uh, people, for instance, uh, let, me, let me just do this little tangent here. People who are today, uh, there, is a, there is an organization called uh, the, uh, the Lincoln Project. These are uh, never Trumpers, people who really believe that Trump really has hijacked the Republican Party, the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, they're called the Lincoln Project. And many of those people who were, who are now in the Lincoln Project, are people who were running John McCain's uh, uh, campaign. And they are the ones who brought Sarah Palin in. And she yeah. is the one who had so much influence on the Republican Party going, becoming so populist. Mm. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's hard to see when, when this really started, but the Republican Party, since the Reagan years, had little by little, little by little, lost its ideological belonging, lost its ideological underpinning. The good old conservative, uh, you know, Ayn Rand kind of capitalism uh, and libertarianism has really changed a lot from Ronald Reagan years to today. Okay. Now, I, I want to ask you something. It's a bit of an Adelaide tieback. What do you think uh, Rupert Murdoch's media had in pump priming a lot of what we what we saw leading up to the election of Trump? Now, you know, Rupert is a good old Adelaide boy, so he's a, also a media titan, the current uh, Citizen Kane, if you will. So what, what, what role did he, did he have? Rupert Murdoch is, uh, is a person who, uh, you know, he's a right winger. Uh, he's a conservative. He uh, he has uh, a lot of money to invest in uh, in propagating the uh, ideology that he has, and uh, so do uh, millions of other people. Uh, in the United States, there are uh, quite a few billionaires who are really influencing uh, politics in uh, radical ways. And uh, Murdoch did the very same thing. His best. Uh, organ obviously is uh, uh, the uh, is Fox News and uh, all those Fox uh, related uh, affiliated uh, uh, talk show hosts and commentators and all these people. Uh, he also uh, has the uh, you know owns the uh, Wall Street Journal. So uh, there is a lot of uh, opinion that is influenced by the Robert uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, uh, money, obviously. You know, this is this is not to fault him. He's you know he, he's an ideologue. He wants to do certain things. The problem with with this thing is that Fox News and and Murdoch have gotten swept away into the lie of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, um, uh, what's uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I I forget the name of the book that was uh, Under Fire. Was it Under Fire or Fire and or, Fury? Uh, I think. That was the first really good yeah. expose of the early Trump White House mm. by a journo they trusted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's uh, uh, someone uh, wolf. Anyway, he, he yeah. starts his, his book. He starts his book by talking about Rupert Murdoch, who met Trump, uh, but through some people, and he didn't really know Trump, Donald Trump, and uh, and uh, you know, well, once he met Trump, he he threw his uh, uh, his money back behind him and started supporting him. The problem is. Uh, this is this is uh, yeah. Uh, today, uh, Fox News. Uh, honestly, I mean, you cannot really look at Fox News in, in totality. There are those people in Fox News, uh, you know, Chris Wallace and people like that who are still, you know, journalists who really want the truth to be out there. But a lot of the other people have bought into the lie of Donald Trump. I mean, you know, they, they still don't believe that uh, you know. Or I'm not telling the people that uh, Joe Biden is the president of the United States. So uh, they have bought into this whole lie, and Fox News is being affected by this. And the problem with it is that even for the, the right wingness of Fox News is being challenged by other right wing outfits, More right like the Newsmaxes, like Newsmax and uh, and uh, AON, uh, or, or sorry, or uh, OANN. Uh, 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 one America network, a news network or something like that. So these are 
to the right of the Fox News, of Fox News. And now Fox News is losing audience to these two networks. Thus, Fox News is becoming even more uh, a right wing than it was before. So uh, Rupert Murdoch is, is not being the, the right media person in the traditional sense of a media journalist who has to be uh, you know, uh, objective and neutral and reporting the facts as they are and stuff like that. Uh, that's why his son just broke away from him, broke away from him and he's, uh, only one of his sons is really uh, with him on this. So uh, it's, it's a, uh, Fox News has not been since the, uh, what, about 10 years ago. You know, uh, the Roger Ailes, uh, mm-hmm. Roger Ailes died, and, uh, uh, but after that, a new generation came in that was really horrible, horrible as uh, news people or, uh, or commentators. Or, uh, uh, so uh, in, in a sense, Fox News is doing a very bad disservice to American democracy. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch should know that. I think he does know that, but I think the uh, issue of, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a money issue. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, where, where do advertisers go? And uh, I understand that there are some advertisers who are really actually reluctant to support any of the programming that's on Fox News today. Rosebud. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> it's my throwback to Citizen Kane. Okay, Tim. <laughs> Well, I, I, this is certainly a pattern I feel like Fox News has facilitated, but I, you know, I really like the observation of kind of the precedent of Trump being kind of President Bush or uh, Junior, uh, and the observation I would like to make and perhaps verify by you guys is is whether that really is just a legacy of saying one thing and doing another. That you know, from what I understand, Dick Cheney really did a lot of the. Um, actual politicking in in that presidency and made a lot of kind of things happen but bush was really in charge of doing the whole virtue signaling saying this is this is what we believe in this is um kind of doing the marketing campaign and um it was kind of enacted um or or certain things were done you know back deal the backdoor deals and all kinds of things are done kind of in a in a chainy kind of way and that was totally facilitated by fox news who really focused on the virtue signaling kind of narratives we don't actually have to focus on exactly what dick, dick cheney is doing so long as we can argue about what president bush has said and that seems to be an, another way that we could describe some of the media surrounding trump for instance we we argue about exactly what he's said and not necessarily reporting exactly what he's doing uh, would that be a kind of an, an accurate way to kind of describe that as a precedent that seems Fair. Or is that normal for Washington that the president is the virtue signaler and there's a two or three people on the staff who get things done? And the problem is unless the media are very good, mm. how would we ever know what the fixers did? Well, I mean, you know, here in Australian politics, we used to say that our dictatorial Queensland uh, premier, Joe Bielke peterson had the white shoe brigade. Uh, he was the virtue signaller. Yep. He was throwing the uh, chicken feed to the chickens, namely the media, mm. uh, doing all kinds of terrible things within the borders of Queensland. Um, but yet the white shoe brigade were the ones that actually ran the show. Right. Uh, so I suppose it, it kind of works like that in pretty much mm. any political setting. Yeah? Sure. So is is Trump really some kind of pinnacle or, or good um a, an accurate representation of just the 21st century politics. Is well, he's proof of the inevitable. swamp in a sense because no. what it is now is that you don't even need to virtue single, signal in a positive way. You only need to virtue signal in a, a populist way. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's what it represents. Yeah. yeah. No, the, 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 the temporal difference is, is important here. Uh, Tim is very, very right. Uh, the, the, I mean, uh, George, George, uh, George W. was not necessarily uh, <laughs> a very bright guy. Uh, and uh, Dick Cheney did have a lot of influence on American policy anywhere, in, in domestically and internationally. And uh, the people, the ideologues who were around George Bush also uh, did uh, really heinous things. Um, uh, the, the, the difference, however, is in the degree to which the Republican Party has become populist versus uh, remaining conservative uh, uh, and, and ideological. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
the Republicans who were with George Bush were very, very much interested in being with, John, with Donald Trump and conducting his administration, except that he did not want them to be there because they were too intellectual for him. They would have dwarfed him, intellectually speaking. Okay, he did. He wanted yes men. This is why the uh, the um, uh, Rex Tillersons and the uh, and and uh, Mark Kelly. Um, um, my, uh, What's his name? Uh, the chief of staff, uh, Mark or um, Mike Kelly or uh, 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 Mike Kelly. I forget. Uh, yeah, Mike Kelly. Yeah, yeah. and uh, pe- people like that, and uh, the, uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, uh, from uh, uh, Jim Mattis. Uh, mm. You know, these are the people who had a uh, an intellectual and political uh, acumen, mm. and they're and, all gone. But they were yeah. not mm. yes men. Donald Trump looked for yes men, and mm. the people who served in his administration were yes men. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't brook uh, criticism or or dissent, and uh, or even discussion, he which he doesn't understand. Mm. He mm. he hardly kept anybody for for a way of working. Imad, if I could just say, uh, you know, you, we also see this in his legal team as well. Yeah. I mean, he's 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 roped in a cast of clowns, of crazy lawyers, absolute clowns. But they're all yes men, yeah. and so you know, uh, no matter yeah. how crazy the defense of Donald Trump will be in the civil courts, they will put the best case forward for crazy, mm. right? And so yeah. you know, we we see this across the board. It wasn't just a political thing; it's also a legal thing with Trump as well. Mm. Right. Uh. Yeah. But then, but then, you know, there, there were there were those people who, who actually, uh, you know, the only the only thing that the the Republican conservative establishment truly succeeded at is in uh, packing the courts, mm. and this was the major major accomplishment that they wanted to have, which 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 they did, and uh, you know they. Uh, he appointed something like a little over 200, 200 federal judges. And uh, all of these uh, uh, guys and gals are young people who are going to grow up Be there for 40 into years. that system yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and become uh, you know, uh, uh, judges later on and uh, maybe uh, uh, for, for, for a long, long period of time. Okay, Ahmad, uh, we'll have to wind up, but I've got one final question for you. How do you think history is going to remember the Trump years? I mean, there's been a lot of sleaze, as you said, public dismissals of key administration personnel. We had FBI right. investigations and, of course, the two impeachment trials. You'd think this would be enough to bury the memory of this administration in a mountain of shame, right? Uh, yes, it will, but nobody is going to, to, to forget it. It was a dangerous administration for American democracy. It was a very, very dangerous administration for American uh, interests and reputation around the world. So we're, we're, I mean, uh, this is why people are going to keep remembering it, and specifically, and especially the Democrats, because uh, because they know that the United States, unfortunately, got this close to really losing his democracy. Had January 6th succeeded, well, Donald Trump would have would have died in office and his son or his daughter would have come after him to be president of the yeah. United States. Yeah. Uh, really, we should, nobody should really underestimate the significance of the failure of the January 6th insurrection. And this is the terrible thing about what this might then mean, is that for a whole pile of radical populists, they've now seen what's possible. So if anything, yeah. it's convinced them of the fragility of democracy in America, going, if we just keep pushing. Mm. So this idea of a continuing Trump movement now, whether they do something with the 14th Amendment and manage to get it that he can never stand again, but this populist movement is now a train and it's rolling and it's, it's moving faster. This is why uh, everybody should be very, very vigilant, really vigilant these days, uh, because uh, these people can come back anytime and do it again. Yeah. 
Okay, well, everyone, that's a wrap. My thanks to our guest, Imad Ha, for being on Strategicon. My thanks Thank to... you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. My thanks also Thank to co-host David Olney and to producer Tim Whiffen for their contributions. And to our audience, thanks for listening. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to the audio version of Strategicon through the OzCast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn and Spotify. And please like, uh, like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. You can always watch our podcasts on video through the Strategicon Raw YouTube channel, easily accessed by clicking on the link provided on our website. Also, please comment on any of our, or any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, on the Sage International Australia site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. If you would like to support Strategicon, remember to check out our merch page. We have a wide variety of items to keep the Strategicon listeners satisfied. Until next time, goodbye. Oscast. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.